I'm Nick Pettit. I'm Jason Seifer. And you're watching The Treehouse Show, your weekly dose of internets where we talk about all things web design, web development, and more. For a free month at Treehouse, head on over to teamtreehouse.com slash show. In this episode, we'll be talking about curated jQuery plugins, progress bars, HTTP API design, and more. Let's check it out. First up is selectize.js. Selectize is a hybrid of a text box and a select box, and it relies on jQuery, and it allows you to tag things, create contact lists, country selectors, and so on. Based on the name, I thought it was just a plugin that allows you to select only the letter I on a web page. Nope, you can select anything, actually. Get it? Select eyes? I, I understood the joke. Uh, it clocks in at seven kilobytes, so that's not as good as like, I don't know, five or six kilobytes, but seven kilobytes is pretty small. Just kidding there. If we scroll down the page, there's a couple of demos here, so I could tag stuff. Awesome, neat, Jason, Nick, Treehouse. It's like magnetic poetry for a text box. It is. We can scroll down further and go to email contacts, so I can email Nikola Tesla. Who knew that you could email him still? That's pretty cool. You may not get a response, but you can email. If you could talk to anyone, living or dead, are you a sorcerer? We can go to... For the record, I would choose living. <laughs> we can go to these select boxes here, option groups, all sorts of cool stuff, and each demo has the code, so you can see exactly how it works. So for example, you can regex an email just like that, and there's a bunch of different options that you can set. Anyway, it's really cool uh, jQuery plugin, so definitely be sure to check this one out. Very nice. Next up, we have a website called Pull Push. Now, this is not a metaphor for mine and Nick's relationship. This is a curated library of well-maintained jQuery and plain JavaScript plugins and libraries. Now, lots of these libraries you may have seen before on this very Treehouse show, and there is a nice little classification on the left. This leans a little bit more towards front-end plugins. We have responsive plugins, modal dialogues, carousels, etc. Um, like I said, leans a little bit more towards front end, and there are really not that many to choose from within each category, which is good because you can just come on over here to this website, head on over to the category of the plugin you want, and boom, you have just a few choices, and you know they're good because it is a curated library. And it's not, on the internet. It's so on I mean, the internet, so you know it's good. You've got to trust it, right? Yeah, I trust everything on the internet. Hmm. And that's it. That's all I have to say about that. Very nice. Well, next up is number progress bar. This is a progress bar similar to what you might actually find in Android. The idea was inspired by this number progress bar, which is written in Android. So there's what that looks like, and you can see the Android code down here. Someone made something very similar in HTML and CSS. So if we go to the GitHub page here, can scroll down and install it with Bower, and here's how you do it with HTML. So just a couple of div tags you need there. And then here is CSS, and of course you can make your own modifications to that. And then there's some JavaScript with options. So some of the options you can set is the style, the duration, the minimum and maximum values, and so on. So this is Really cool. If you are creating a progress bar, you may also want to look into the progress element. It could be a slightly more semantic way to do this, but if you are working in a browser that maybe doesn't support that or you're in some situation where you just can't use the progress element, this is a pretty good alternative to that. Hmm, very nice. Mm -hmm. Next up, we have a well, not a blog post, a GitHub repository with a guide on HTTP API design. When you are designing an HTTP API, there are a lot of do's and a lot of don'ts that go into having a well-maintained and well-thought-out API. This guide attempts to put all of those into an easy-to-follow list with a lot of good information. So, return appropriate status codes, kind of really get into the nitty-gritty of HTTP. 
and what you, what you are supposed to return for get, delete, and patch calls. This guide was taken from a lot of Heroku's design, and there are some very interesting things that you'll get in here. For example, accept serialized JSON in request bodies. That is important, and also you can have a little, little JSON object right here. It's got an ID and a name. Another thing to keep in mind, instead of saying owner underscore email and owner underscore ID like in this example, may as well give owner its own property. Now this is actually a very, very long guide with a lot of information, so we're not going to get into all of that here on the show, but we will have a link to it in the show notes, which you can check out at youtube.com slash go treehouse. You can also search for us in iTunes, we are The Treehouse Show, and don't forget to try Treehouse for 30 days free at teamtreehouse.com slash show. Very nice stuff. Well, next up is Pro Found Grid. It is the pro version of Found Grid. Actually, I think it might say Profound Grid. It's a responsive grid system for fixed and fluid layouts. So if you're familiar with Foundation or Bootstrap, which are front-end frameworks, this is kind of a similar thing, but it may be a little bit more lightweight if you just need a very simple and semantic grid. So here are some examples. Wow, I feel like I'm playing like Space Invaders or Breakout or something here. But if we can click on these, you can see what this grid looks like. And you can actually turn the grid on and off so you can see that these line up exactly like you would expect with this, to with this 12 column grid here. So I can click through and you can see what a couple of these look like so you can hit the sides of the browser window if you want to or create something with more of a max width. So anyway, not a whole lot to say about it. It's uh, pretty lightweight though, pretty cool stuff and it allows you to customize it with SCSS, so that's really nice. Oh, very, very nice. Mm -hmm. uh, next up, we have a blog post called slash page load times with CSS font subsetting. What in the world does that mean? Well, let me tell you what it means. <laughs> CSS font subsetting is taking only a specific subset of the CSS font that you will be using. So the example that they really get into here is with Google Web Fonts. Let's say you are using a Google Web Font like Open Sans. Here is how you would normally embed that font in your page. You would do a link with the reference to the specific font and give it a rel of style sheet. But if you limit this to just certain characters, you can add a little ampersand argument here and the text that you want it to display. What's, what that's going to do is serve only those specific characters from that font style sheet. So what that will result in is a smaller file size resulting in a quicker overall experience for your users. Now this article goes into a little bit more detail about how to embed that in your page. It's a really a great te technique and also really important as mobile devices are more, more on the web. Prevalent. Prevalent is the word that I was looking for. So, yeah, that's about all we got time for today. We, we are out of steam here. Nick, who are you on Twitter? I am at NickRP. And I am at Jay Cypher. For more information on anything we talked about, check out our show notes at youtube.com slash go treehouse. You can also search for us in iTunes. We're the Treehouse Show, and please don't forget to rate us. And of course, if you'd like to see more videos like this one about web design, web development, mobile, business, and so much more, be sure to check us out at teamtreehouse.com slash show to get a free 30-day trial. Thank you so much for watching, and we will see you next week.